chaired the ethics committee and was the ethicist in residence for Shepard Pratt for over 20 years. He is teaching faculty at, at Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland and Tulane. Um, also a member of the APA assembly and has served six years on the APA ethics committee and helped craft an APA um, position statement in December 2016. I remember when this was all going on, that was the beginning of my tenure in the assembly. Um, a psychiatrist should not prescribe or administer any intervention to a non-terminally ill person for the purpose of causing death. Um, he has traveled widely uh, speaking on the subject. He wrote a wonderful chapter for my book called Tipping the Scales on medical, legal and ethical challenges in eating disorders um, with regard to physician assisted death in the eating disorder uh, population. And he's consulted many times with policymakers in Canada, trying to dissuade them from um, you know, changing euthanasia law. Um, so uh, we welcome Dr. Dr. Mark Comrade, um, who I've really had the pleasure of getting to know over the last se several years. And I was just telling uh, one of my medical students that Dr. Comrade knows no more about this topic than anyone I know of. So welcome, Dr. Comrade. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Westmoreland. And I welcome this opportunity to add a third uh, leg to our stool of collaboration. This is the first third time we've done something together. Yes. Uh, Three legs make for a stable stool. So thank you for the opportunity and opportunity, especially to talk uh, to the residents who indeed have a career that's, I think, going to encounter this, not just as a theoretical discussion in ethics workshops, but really on the ground of the clinical trenches as these practices become more uh, legalized in more states here in the United States. Uh, and inevitably, as I'm going to demonstrate to you based on the data from the living laboratories of other countries, uh, almost inevitably in, uh, opens the door to our psychiatric patients, uh, kind of as an unintended consequence of parity. So uh, I appreciate this opportunity. I've really been a, a medical ethicist for uh, several decades, as well as a clinician. And uh, frankly, this is the first topic in ethics that has so uh, aroused my passion, so sent me up the Z axis, so to speak, that really it's gradually been transforming me from an ethicist into an activist uh, as I go around the world speaking to legislatures, policymakers, and so forth about my concerns. I definitely have a point of view on this, as you will soon see. Uh, that I'm quite concerned that this may, uh, these kinds of practices, particularly for psychiatric patients, but really for people in general, uh, is, are neither good medical ethics nor good public policy. And particularly at this time with the pandemic where we are all being exposed to uh, death at a level of never before, I think uh, our whole society's attitudes towards uh, death, uh, the acceptability of death, uh, even the desirability of death, uh, is really beginning to change quite rapidly. So uh, it's interesting to now be giving these kinds of talks against the background uh, of this dreadful pandemic. So uh, it was Melville who said, woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall. Uh, and I'm afraid that it is my duty today to appall you, or at least to share with you my sense of why I am appalled and why, as I said, this is transforming me from ethicist into a much more engaged activist. So uh, today, I, first we're gonna review the language, which is quite important as with many of these controversial topics, uh, who owns the language may own the debate, or at least uh, it's used to create uh, evocative, provocative consequences. Then I'm gonna review the actual data of what's going on here in the United States, in Canada, and particularly what's happening in Europe in the Benelux countries, Netherlands and Belgium, where some of the practices that I'm worried about have been going on for nearly 20 years. And then bringing it back to some more specific ethical and clinical reflections about why I'm concerned about this as a clinician and as an ethicist. So it was Camus who said there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide, which is certainly in our domain and our wheelhouse is, is our specialty. Uh, and certainly is uh, because uh, 
here we are with the, the great philosopher Camus showing that really this issue lies at the intersection between uh, philosophy, uh, which is uh, of which ethics is a branch and psychiatry. But Camus also said to misname things adds to the world's misery. So let's talk a little bit about naming. It was Humpty Dumpty who famously says in Alice in Wonderland, a word means what I want it to mean, nothing more, nothing less. So there's been a lot of uh, struggle over language and how we should use language to talk about this situation. Uh, certainly uh, the CDC's definition of suicide is one with which we as psychiatrists are quite familiar and common sense definition and certainly comes from our daily activities uh, in the clinical trenches. That suicide is death caused by self-directed behavior with an intent to die. That's certainly familiar to all of us uh, as, uh, as an accurate uh, description. However, uh, with recent controversies, organizations like the American Association of Suicidality decided to change the definition of suicide when they say legal physician assisted deaths should not be considered cases of suicide. Uh, and I wanna invite you to question that as clinicians who deal with suicide as in many ways or suicidal thinking is the bread and butter of what we do uh, in our daily professional lives. Orwell said, if thought can corrupt language, language can corrupt thought. And hence the slogans in his book, 1984, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength, and now many want to add phrases such as providing suicide to some patients as treatment, that euthanasia is palliative care. So let's talk about some definitions uh, and some phrases that are used. There are many phrases that are out there to describe this issue, physician assisted suicide, voluntary euthanasia, compassionate assistance to die, physician assisted dying, medical aid in dying made, that's the term preferred in Canada, and Australia, go gently Australia. That's kind of like a, like a laxative commercial. Uh, death with dignity, medical murder. Uh, Jack Kevorkian, who kind of got this stirred up uh, several decades ago, wanted to coin the term metacide. It never caught on. There's this curious organization called the World Federation of Right to Die Societies that wants to promote the term dignicide. Uh, that they're trying to promulgate as a, a word that we should use for this. So you can see there are many different ways of dressing this up. Uh, to me, all of this, I would call verbicide. Um, this uh, executive director of this society, the World Federation of Right to Die Society, uh, even recognizes how much we're straining to bend the language. He says, I always refrain from using the word killing. You terminate life. And actually more than that, you terminate the suffering. Get used to that idea because it is counterhuman a little bit. Uh, and indeed it is counterhuman uh, a little bit. My grandkids came to visit. They talked mostly about world politics, kept asking me how I felt about the youth in Asia. So all sorts of ways of bending language. But here are the terms that really are, are the terms of art that are used. There are kind of three levels, three actions of physicians uh, that are involved in patients who are dying in order to uh, allow death to come. Uh, in order of increasing moral complexity, the first level is really palliative care. This is really the ethical standard uh, in which we, uh, on certain circumstances, in this case is a futility, uh, or on advanced directives, we will withdraw life su support, life sustaining measures, but in that place provides state-of-the-art care for comfort. This is not at this point an ethically controversial matter. The next term of art is physician-assisted suicide. In, the, in this term, this which is what we have in some states in the United States, the doctor writes a prescription and provides it to the patient for lethal medication to take at the time and place of their own choosing, uh, with or without witnesses, with or without physicians. Uh, hopefully, you know, uh, they, uh, it's used, uh, it's sometimes stored away and hopefully uh, not uh, co-opted by uh, the patient's suicidal granddaughter who finds it in the back of the closet uh, because there's no monitoring of these things once they're released. But these are self-administered uh, medications and we call that physician-assisted suicide. Uh, 
And then the most controversial level of all, uh, but happens to be the practice through most of the world where this is going on is euthanasia. Euthanasia refers to the doctor being present and giving a lethal injection, just like in a prison execution. Uh, the doctor produces death. Uh, in the level one, he, gets out, the, he or she gets out of the way of the death. Level two, the doctor provides the chemical gun or the means that the patient uses. In euthanasia, the physician directly causes death by lethal injection. So we're gonna primarily focus on these latter two terms. So now let's take a look at kind of the state of where things are at beginning with our own country, the United States. So currently, including your own state, uh, these are the states uh, that have some form of uh, law that permits uh, physician assisted suicide. Uh, this is not euthanasia. There are no euthanasia's uh, uh, laws available in the United States yet. Uh, and all of these laws have in common that it's strictly for patients at the end of life, typically defined as tw somewhere between six and 12 months prognosis to live. Now, some important things uh, to also know, it's not been easy to pass these laws. Uh, since 1995, there have been 158 attempts uh, to pass such laws in uh, all 50 states uh, through the end of last year. Uh, there are some states uh, like New York where there have been up to 11 tries to pass such a law. And there are even those states shown on the right uh, that have gone so far as to ban that there should be such a law to kind of inoculate themselves against such laws saying that uh, we will not allow a law that says we will not permit an, a, a bill for assisted suicide in our state. So in the United States, although we have uh, this collection of states that have passed them, they're still in the minority and there have been a lot of failed attempts. Now, all of these laws have certain things in common uh, with the exception of Hawaii in when a patient seeks uh, to have assisted suicide prescription written, there is no mandatory mental health assessment. Physicians are told if they believe a patient might have a psychiatric condition, it would be advisable to consult a mental health professional, but in no law except, uh, state of Hawaii, except for Hawaii, is it mandatory? And in mandatory, those assessments can be done by non-physicians like social workers and psychologists. Uh, you, people have to be considered competent, have capacity, but no law requires any special training by the clearing uh, uh, physicians uh, in capacity assessment, which uh, I consider a specialty in our field. The specialty, not even every psychiatrist has. The forensic psychiatrists are particularly trained in that. But any physician can be part of the screening process. Doesn't have to be anybody with training for uh, capacity assessment. Any physician can act as a second opinion. Most of them need a second opinion. Even you know your partner in your same practice. So it doesn't have to be independent. There are no requirements in any of these laws that a patient have any attempt whatsoever at palliative care. No witnesses are required to verify that there wasn't coercion involved or conflict of interest. Uh, there is no workup or evaluation, no standards, no requirement that anybody uh, ascertain that there's not coercion involved in you know, asking grandma to move it along. Uh, uh, so no, no, even no statutory definitions of where you draw the line between encouragement and coercion. The physicians who are involved in screening patients for eligibility, there's no minimum length of time that a doctor-patient relationship is necessary uh, to have that happen. And so uh, if you one doctor says no, you can keep shopping around for a doctor who will say yes. Uh, and uh, patients still, as the ethical standard, have a right to refuse treatment. What does that mean? That means that a person can have a treatable illness and refuse treatment, thus converting a treatable illness into a terminal illness, stopping dialysis, refusing uh, chemotherapy, um, you know, all the standard ways that we now uh, ethically accept that patients can refuse treatment. Uh, so uh, if you have to be terminally ill, you can actually create a terminal illness by refusing treatment and the law does not prohibit that, uh, nor sanction doctors that, uh, uh, may take advantage of that situation. And once the lethal medications are dispensed, uh, we have no formal system in any of the states so far for tracking what happens 
to those medications. So here in Oregon, you can see uh, they have had, uh, they were the first in the United States uh, back in uh, 1997 to legalize assisted suicide. You can see the total number of prescriptions that were uh, written and the total number that were used. And those are not identical. And as a matter of fact, about a quarter of the prescriptions that were written were never used. Uh, so as of 19, uh, 2019, uh, we have these statistics, about 10% of people were under age 55, six people took the medications and failed to die. In one case, it took up to four days for the lethal cocktail to work. And because the law doesn't require them, and in the vast majority of cases, no physician was present uh, to these final proceedings. So what happens to all of these unused medications? Where do they go? Uh, we have absolutely no idea. As far as we know, they're still in people's closets. Uh, in one case, uh, we, uh, the pills sat around for over four years before they were finally used. So uh, patients are always uh, assessed as to what are some of the reasons that you want this. And if you look at the top reasons in the two states that have had this the longest, Oregon and Washington, the top, top reasons are people who fear losing autonomy, uh, they're worried that they're going to be unable to engage in activities. They're worried about losing their dignity, being burdened to their families. You see that the very small minority are actually asking for this because of current pain. The reasons are typically reasons that are in our wheelhouse as psychiatrists, anxiety, fear, apprehension about the future. Uh, and yet, and yet, uh, there is, as I said, no requirement to work with the mental health professional uh, to deal with those fears. It was Michelle Montagna who famously said, he who fears he shall suffer already suffers what he fears. So because there's no requirement, uh, looking here uh, at Oregon, in the first uh, couple of years that this was legal, they were quite anxious to involve psychiatrists to make sure there was capacity maybe to deal with people's fears. Uh, about one third of patients got referred to a psychiatrist, but you see how that dwindled off to negligible levels uh, in subsequent years involving psychiatrists. Here is one study that was done of 58 people who already had received their lethal medication, who were then reviewed by uh, psychiatrists. And of those people, 31% were found to meet criteria for major depression uh, in a clinical evaluation. Uh, none of those depressions had been identified by the primary physicians who had pre already prescribed the medications. Seven patients felt, yeah, I'm depressed, but it's completely irrelevant to my uh, desire to have something that can help me commit suicide. And uh, although everybody was offered free psychiatric treatment to deal with that clinical depression, only one accepted that referral. All right, let's move north to Canada. Uh, where they call it MAID, medical assistance in dying, and where the primary uh, activity and, and the other countries we'll be talking about is not assisted suicide, it is euthanasia. So in 2016, uh, Canada legalized uh, euthanasia. Uh, and in interestingly, they came up with their own term. Their term was not terminally ill. It was people for whom uh, death was in the reasonably foreseeable future, a brand new term that somehow made, was thought to be associated somewhere towards the end of life, but was not statutorily defined. So it turned out it wasn't really limited to people who had 12 months or less to live. They also included as the criteria that patients had an intolerable condition, that they were suffering, and that their condition was untreatable. And just note that it is up to the patient, not the doctor to say that their condition is intolerable. And uh, because patients can refuse certain treatments, as we said before, the patient also weighs in as to whether their condition is untreatable. And now I'm offering you uh, hemodialysis. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad that will help me, but uh, no thank you. Uh, that would constitute an untreatable condition. As I said, euthanasia is uh, far and away 99.99% uh, because given an opportunity to outsource these procedures to physicians to make it a medical procedure, the vast majority of people uh, in any country where euthanasia is available, they take that opportunity 
to have the doctor do it to them rather than to have to take mouthfuls of pills uh, themselves. Now in this law, the so-called C-14 law in 2016, the people with mental illness were excluded. The other thing to know in Canada, uh, they declared that uh, because healthcare is considered a right, according to the Canadian Charter, which is their constitution, this, because it's a medical procedure, is considered a healthcare right, uh, which is interesting because palliative care was never designated as a healthcare right in Canada, but made is considered a healthcare right in Canada. Incidentally, you might be interested to know the courts have never. Uh, concluded here in the United States that healthcare is actually a constitutional right. So uh, they're off to the races in Canada. Um, you can see how it's grown over the years, primarily euthanasia. Two out of every 100 human beings who die in the nation of Canada now die at the sharp end of a doctor's needle with the intention of killing them. Uh, as of November of last year, uh, there have been over 19,000 euthanasians uh, throughout Canada. Uh, so although uh, the mentally ill, uh, people with psychiatric disorders are excluded, there are many, many people pushing for the uh, modification of the law to include the mentally ill, such as the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association, Dying with Dignity Canada, the former organization, right, that excluding patients suffering from mental illness would have the perverse result of leaving such patients with no options but to continue to suffer intolerably because they say that people with psychiatric illnesses can have intolerable and untreatable conditions and that it is perverse to exclude psychiatric patients. Uh, the Dementia Advocacy uh, Canada Association has long been pushing for having advanced directives available for one particular se sector of psychiatric conditions, which is dementia. Uh, pushing for uh, the people with dementia to have the right to made by advanced directives. And scholars all over the country, especially non-physician scholars, you know, are writing articles like this, why mentally ill people should, of course, be eligible for assisted dying. So there's been a push for that over the course of the last four years. And then in September of 2019, the criteria that people must have their death in, uh, to be anticipated in the foreseeable future was challenged in court in Quebec. And the court found that uh, criteria invalid and unconstitutional. And ultimately that court kind finding led to uh, a consideration, reconsideration on the national level. And that is going on right now in Canada where they are currently debating, it was introduced in February, put on pause, now back again since October, the so-called C-7 bill. The C-7 bill is seeking to extend the criteria in Canada. How? Well, first of all, based on that court case in Quebec, they're saying they're wanting to eliminate uh, natural death in the foreseeable future as a criterion so that uh, a patient person does not have to necessarily be at the end of life. Uh, now, they're saying in this particular bill that for these purposes, mental illness should not be considered uh, eligible uh, because it, it should not be considered a serious incurable disease or disability. You can see how that is gonna be open to quite uh, a controversial fight. And also because the current criteria and that they wanna continue includes psychological suffering, not just physical suffering, uh, that despite the fact that this new law is still trying to hold the line at excluding people with mental illness, that's gonna be very difficult to do in light of those other two criteria. Uh, once you raise, uh, you eliminate the barrier of end of life uh, as an exclusion criterion. So those of us who are thinking about this and watching this very closely fully anticipate that if this bill is passed, uh, that the next step will be to open it to the mentally ill uh, because this moves things, the C14, C7 bill moves it back away from terminal conditions towards the eligibility of chronic conditions, which would include psychiatric conditions. And as a matter of fact, just this past March, 
in light of these discussions, the Canadian Psychiatric Association actually said patients with a psychiatric illness should not be discriminated against solely on the basis of their disability and should have available the same options regarding MAID as available to all patients. In other words, we're still fighting for parity, even here, and if the law changes to include people with chronic conditions, our sister organization of the APA, the Canadian Psychiatric Association says, we're going to support that. Uh, in fact, if you do uh, this, you know, polls are always fraught with problems. Uh, here was a poll of psychiatrists in Canada, only a 21% response rate. You see that most psychiatrists are support made for so-called medical conditions, but one out of three of the respondents here, at least, uh, also said, yes, made should be open for psychiatric patients because they feel that excluding uh, uh, psychiatric patients is further stigmatizing people with mental illness, minimizing their suffering, reinforcing the myth that they could be cured if they just tried harder. So the Minister of Justice in Canada and the Attorney General are strongly pushing for the passing of this C7 bill that will extend euthanasia to the chronically ill and follow the examples of what we're about to see in Europe. And in fact, the Attorney General Lametti says that, as you can see here in this quote, he hopes that MAID will eventually be further expanded to people who are suffering solely from mental illness. So although the C7 bill is trying to continue to exclude people with mental illness, the Attorney General of Canada is saying that it is his vision, and in fact, he's dedicated to the mission that after the C7 passes, the next step will be to open it to psychiatric patients. So that's the situation in Canada. So now let's cross the Atlantic to the Benelux countries, uh, where uh, these practices, uh, including psychiatric patients, have been going on now for uh, nearly two decades. So these are living laboratories in which we can see what happens when these practices uh, are, uh, have a while to run uh, and what happens as perhaps uh, a bellwether of what's to come as Canada approaches that and as many of us believe eventually the United States as well. So in these two countries in 2002 uh, and uh, Luxembourg as well, uh, they got out of the conversation. They, they dispensed with the whole distinction between terminal and non-terminal and death in the foreseeable future and so forth. So they effaced the difference between that. They also effaced the difference between physical and mental suffering. They were the first to do so, saying that suffering is suffering is suffering, and whether it's physical or mental, and certainly that's something that we as psychiatrists could subscribe to and are familiar with. So in terms of uh, the legalization of euthanasia, which they uh, struck in 2002, they got rid of terminal and non-terminal and they replaced it with the criteria that merely a patient's condition has to be unbearable to them and considered untreatable. Uh, and as a result, unbearable and untreatable plus mental suffering or physical suffering, uh, that ended up opening the door to psychiatric patients. We also ended up opening the door to children and to advanced directives for dementia in that country, uh, those countries. And the practices there overwhelmingly uh, are euthanasia. As a matter of fact, I I'm not sure there are any cases in the last year of assisted suicide by, by prescription reported in these countries. They're all euthanasia. So let's look at some of the data from there, beginning with the Netherlands. So, uh, Things have really taken off since 2002 there. Uh, there's been a 350% increase. Now, nearly five out of every human beings who die in the Netherlands die uh, at the receiving end of a lethal injection by a physician. And as a matter of fact, uh, this article in the New England Journal uh, estimated that uh, as many as 23% of euthanasias there go unreported. Uh, so you see that, uh, you know, the numbers may be much higher than this. So they're up, uh, you know, around uh, over 6,000 people a year are receiving euthanasia there. Now, as I said to you, psychiatric conditions are eligible, psychiatric conditions only. Uh, only about uh, one or two percent uh, of people who are euthanized have psychiatric disorders. But 
you know, uh, at this point, we see in the Netherlands every four days, somebody with uh, a mental illness uh, as their only condition, not, you know, mental illness as well as terminally ill, but mental illness alone uh, is euthanized. Now, uh, this uh, does not include, th these numbers do not include dementia. If we add dementia, and I don't have the dementia numbers for 2019 yet, uh, it's even higher. Uh, now, there are two methods for uh, two pathways to euthanasia. One is by your own physician. And the other is if your physician doesn't agree that you're eligible or doesn't want to engage in euthanasia, uh, they've set up clinics to do that. So let's look at both of these settings. So first, here's a series of 66 psychiatric patients who were euthanized. Uh, the majority of them, 73% of them, well, they were all euthanized by, by uh, a physician, of course, but 73% were euthanized by their own treating psychiatrist. That is the same doctor who previously had been trying to prevent their suicide, stave off their suicide, help them find a path to a better future. Their same exhausted psychiatrists eventually gave in and not only approved the euthanasia, but provided the euthanasia. You can see the diagnoses there, mood disorder, anxiety. Amazingly, in something that, especially if you're thinking about capacity and competency, 8% of the euthanasias were people with psychosis. But here's something that we see repeatedly in all of these numbers. The majority of people who are getting euthanized uh, in countries that permit psychiatric euthanasia, uh, who have psychiatric conditions, have personality disorders. Uh, typically is, uh, would not surprise this audience, borderline personality disorder with its chronic suicidal ideation is part of their psychological, dysfunctional psychological coping mechanisms. Uh, Scott Kim, the scientist who really got, uh, fleshed out a lot of this data at uh, NIMH, uh, discovered that almost one out of three people with personality disorder uh, had no history of psychotherapy. And you think about psychotherapy as maybe perhaps the mainstay of dealing with people with personality disorders. Uh, they, despite having no psychotherapy history, they were granted euthanasia. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, over half of people refused one or more recommended treatments in the Netherlands because as you, uh, as we discussed, you can refuse treatment. Uh, and as you know, our patients in particular, you know, uh, endemically are much more likely to refuse treatments, perhaps even by the very nature of the conditions that we treat. Uh, so over half uh, were given euthanasia, even though treatment alternatives were offered to them. Now, the other method in uh, approach in Netherlands is, are these mobile clinics, the Lievenzijnde Klinik, uh, or uh, there, which literally translates into end of life clinic. They've now been euphemized into euthanasia expertise center. These are traveling teams uh, that go around the country. Typical evaluation is one to one and a half hours. The evaluation physician is usually uh, new to the patient. There's no requirement that those uh, evaluating clinics uh, talk to the treating psychiatrists. Uh, and uh, you can see the percent of all euthanasias that are done in these euthanasia centers. I only have the data through 2017. So although uh, in 2016, only 8% of all euthanasias were done in these clinics, 77% of the psychiatric euthanasias were done in these clinics. Why? Because these clinics are available if doctors uh, are reluctant to do it and doctors uh, are clearly more reluctant to do psychiatric euthanasia uh, for, for psychiatric indications and others. So there's a uh, considerable uh, shunting of uh, these patients to these euthanasia expertise centers. Uh, now things have continued to grow from there. Uh, the Dutch Supreme Court uh, has uh, ruled back in April of last year uh, that advanced directives uh, making it easier to have that for dementia. Uh, back in October of last year, they now extended euthanasia to be available for children as young as one year old uh, with, uh, with parental consent. Uh, and uh, the, this was very pushed by the Dutch health minister. And then for several years now, the uh, very liberal D66 party has been trying to uncouple 
euthanasia from medical indications. Uh, and although they wanna keep it medicalized in the sense that you sh this should be considered a medical procedure, they are pushing very hard in, uh, as the slope continues to slip and the mission continues to creep uh, for making completed lives the criteria for eligibility. People who are tired of living or feel that their lives are complete. And this is the direction uh, that they're headed towards, including uh, there are now movements uh, by the same, uh, some several Dutch organizations and the same uh, political party to actually provide an over-the-counter suicide pill, uh, which is interesting, which in many ways, as, as, as horrible as that is, at least as a psychiatrist, I'm one nanometer more comfortable with the idea that if patients want to commit suicide to be able to you know, go and, and get it for themselves and not come knocking on the door of a psychiatrist to put a psychiatrist in the position of providing suicide rather than preventing it. But uh, this is not there yet, but there's a strong movement uh, to now take it to that level where you don't even need doctors anymore. So and uh, tired of living, completed life, over-the-counter suicide pill. That's what happens after a couple of decades of living with euthanasia. Uh, this uh, Dutch philosopher who was originally part of promoting the idea of legalizing euthanasia has now turned into a fierce critic. Uh, he recently reviewed uh, a lot of uh, the cases and he said he's seen about 60 cases in which the patient prior to having a fatal disease was already having suicidal thoughts and suicidal wishes due to psychiatric disorders that had never actually been examined or treated. Uh, and they had refused, when, when they got a fatal disease, they took that as an opportunity to fulfill their suicidal wish by refusing life-saving and life-prolonging treatment and opting for euthanasia that was then completed. All right, now let's uh, move a little south to Belgium, which has uh, uh, struck similar laws. Uh, and actually uh, just uh, uh, in 2016, uh, they uh, took away any lower age limit for children, but they also allow psychiatric euthanasia. And you can see what's been happening there. They've had a thousand, sorry, a thousand percent increase uh, over the course of the uh, last uh, tw uh, 18 years. Uh, now in the Flanders region, 6% uh, of deaths in the Flanders region uh, occur strictly by euthanasia and about 2% of all Belgian deaths. And again, in the New England Journal reported at least back in 2015, as many as 40% they believed were uh, unreported, the data they looked at. Regarding psychiatric cases, uh, here's what's been happening there. Also, you know, on the average about, uh, you know, one psychiatric euthanasia every five to seven days. Interestingly, the majority of them are female. We can talk about that. If you look at not psychiatric cases, but cases where the primary reason that the patient said they wanted euthanasia was because they were psychologically suffering. Remember that data we showed from Oregon and, and, uh, and Washington where fear was the primary uh, uh, cause and psychological suffering because you don't have to be at the end of life in Belgium, could be you know from poverty, uh, from uh, ego dystonic homosexuality, Whatever the psychological suffering reason was, you can see that in 2019, there were uh, about 200 cases, nearly 200 cases where the primary cause, the reason for wanting euthanasia was psychological suffering. So here is just a review of a uh, case series in just 2019, the 57 patients in 2019. Once again, you see that the majority diagnosis was personality disorders. This is the psychiatrist who actually has done about 70% herself of uh, the youth, uh, psychiatric euthanasia. She wrote this book called Libera Me, uh, Free Me on Euthanasia and Psychological Suffering, uh, Liev Tienpont. Uh, and she you know, has kind of uh, been the, the Kevorkian of psychiatric euthanasia in Belgium. So she published this case series of 100 patients uh, and again, uh, although major depression, perhaps not surprising is at the top, uh, personality disorder is actually slightly more. Uh, and in fact, uh, 
about half of those cases are borderline disorder. But look at some of these other things, autistic spectrum disorder, OCD, complicated grief, one case of attention deficit dis disorder, substance abuse, uh, really remarkable, the list uh, that uh, has led towards psychiatric euthanasia in Belgium. Uh, here's a set of twins who were going blind and were psychologically suffering from congenital progressive blindness. They were granted euthanasia in Belgium. Here's a man who had numerous attempts to try to convert himself from uh, being homosexual to being heterosexual uh, without success and because of his continued ego dystonic feelings about his homosexuality was suffering and he felt he what had an insufferable and untreatable condition he was given euthanasia uh, here's a man who tried uh, three transgender surgeries and was not satisfied with the results he was declared untreatable uh, and having an insufferable uh, condition he was granted euthanasia in Belgium, even this guy who was had a life sentence for rape said, I can't tolerate being in prison and I have an irremediable condition because I'm here for life without possibility of parole. He was granted euthanasia, but fortunately there was such a public outcry in his case that the permission for euthanasia was rescinded in the end before it can be accomplished. So um, I'm gonna skip that slide. This is what happens when you live with euthanasia laws for this long. Uh, at, at this point, uh, in, a, in three recent polls, right, this was re highly reproducible result, 40% of Belgians now feel that people over 85 years old, just being over 85 years old, uh, they should no longer be eligible for expensive life prolonging treatments. So the recalibration of the normative parameters of how people think about healthcare and how healthcare should be administered has really resulted of living with an entire generation. I mean, you know, 18 years has now grown up. Uh, pe uh, people who have, uh, who are entering medical school now in, uh, in Belgium have never known a world in which euthanasia was not a treatment option. So this is how the slope has slipped in the living laboratories uh, of these countries. Starts with terminal illness and precesses to chronic illness. It starts to include mental suffering, not just physical. Children are included, advanced directives. There are things here I didn't have a chance to talk about today. It's happening in Canada, for example. Mandatory referral, even if you're a conscientious objector. It starts with major mental illnesses when it opens to psychiatric patients and then progresses to minor mental illnesses like attention deficit disorder uh, and um, uh, uh, uncomfortable lifestyles uh, like uh, ego dystonic homosexuality, prisoners with life sentences. Then you start to get into as they have in Switzerland now, euthanasia tourism, proxy consent for people who are not, don't have capacity, but have uh, a, uh, a healthcare proxy. Um, didn't have a chance to talk about coffee euthanasia. I'm not going to get into that. Eventually, if you can't find family members, we're seeing cases in Belgium and the Netherlands where doctors are taking it upon themselves to decide, listen, I wouldn't want to live if I was a patient like this and administering euthanasia. And then you progress all the way to completed life, tired of living, and over-the-counter suicide pills to enable so-called rational suicide. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the ethical concerns here. The way I see it, unethical ethics are better than no ethics at all. Uh, obviously, that's a joke, folks. So um, just to let you know that uh, euthanasia was a common practice in ancient Greece. As a matter of fact, the myth was that Medusa uh, uh, had uh, some special powers to her blood. The goddess Athena uh, drew blood out of both sides of the Medusa's neck. One side was the life-giving elixir, the other side was a deadly poison. And Athena gave both these vials to the god of medicine, Asclepius, so that doctors could administer either healing balms or, if necessary, uh, lethal medications. <clears throat> and all of the ancient Asclepia, which is where medicine was practiced in the name of the god Asclepius, 
uh, practiced both with one exception. And that one exception was the Asclepian of Hippocrates. That Asclepian was a community that uh, evinced a certain set of values. As a matter of fact, you had to agree to a covenantal arrangement <clears throat> if you wanted to enter as a practitioner in the Hippocratic Asclepian, you had to take an oath. And that oath involved uh, articulating a series of principles. And one of those principles that was in the Hippocratic Oath was, I will not give a fatal drug to anyone if I am asked, neither will I counsel any man to do so. This is the root out of which the mighty tree of medicine grew, grounded in the Hippocratic ethos which over the centuries, this is, became, this tree became uh, the boards out of which the house of medicine was built in which doctors uh, did not, was not considered appropriate to kill your patients, to get out of the way of death, to provide comfort, uh, but not to kill has been at the root uh, of the tree of medicine uh, for many centuries. So we distinguish uh, concept malum in se versus malum prohibitum. Malum in se are things that are bad in and of their own right. Malum prohibitum are things that are bad because the law says that they're bad, they're prohibited. Uh, and those are kind of two different criteria. Heretofore, at least in medical ethics, euthanasia, assisted suicide has been considered malum in se. Uh, but now, uh, the question is, uh, is it being converted into something that is malum prohibitum by law or not? Uh, I just want to remind you that law and ethics are not the same. You know, the Holocaust was legal, so hiding Jews was criminalized. Slavery was legal. Freeing slaves was criminalized. Segregation was legal. Protesting racism was criminalized. Uh, so just because something is legal uh, does not necessarily mean uh, that it is ethical. So what do some of the contemporary medical organizations have to say in the code of ethics that are the continuity of the concept of uh, codes and ethical parameters that we as a, a profession, remember profession comes from the same root as profess. Uh, and it literally means to profess a set of values and principles. So ethics, really is a built-in uh, definitional part of what it means to be a profession. So the American Medical Association, for example, uh, has uh, determined that assisted suicide and euthanasia is fundamentally incompatible with the physician's role as a healer. And this was originally articulated in 19, uh, 1994, but has been twice reaffirmed by the uh, Ethics and Law Committee most recently in 2018, uh, when it's been asked to consider and reconsider this, particularly by physicians who are in uh, those states where this has become legalized, the American Medical Association stands against this. Against this. Similarly, the World Medical Associ Association, which represents uh, medical societies throughout the world, agrees, says that assisted suicide and euthanasia are unethical and must be condemned by the medical profession and that where it's practiced by physicians, the physicians act unethically. Uh, and this uh, was in their original charter and it was reaffirmed twice in 2017 and in 2019. And I will tell you that when it was reaffirmed in 2019, it led to the resignation of the Belgian Psychiatric Society, the Dutch Psychiatric, no, excuse me, the, the Belgian Medical Society, the Dutch Medical Society, and the Canadian Medical Association, all three resigned because uh, their practices in those countries uh, were incompatible and they disagreed with this affirmation and reaffirmation of the World Medical Association. The World Psychiatric Association is a little bit less emphatic says that you know, we should be careful because if psychiatrists should just be aware that people who desire assisted suicide and euthanasia might be distorted by a mental illness such as depression. Uh, however, as uh, Dr. Westmoreland said, I was very involved in helping to craft and, and pass this statement that the American Psychiatric Association 
we stand with the American Psychiatric Association and wanted to have a special statement that particularly was about psychiatrists uh, and particularly designed to be heard in Belgium and the Netherlands and Canada, uh, that a psychiatrist should not prescribe or administer any intervention to a non-terminally ill person for the purpose of causing death. Now, we certainly hold with the AMA that it shouldn't be provided for anybody, but we wanted a special statement to cover our patient population, the non-terminally ill population. So, you know, there are many arguments in favor of this for psychiatric patients that mental suffering is equivalent to physical suffering and that the competence of patients, you know, we, they should be capable of something maybe called rational suicide and that you, that in the interest of parity, it's not good to exclude our patients from any medical procedures. But there are also arguments for, about futility. Uh, that for some patients, uh, so the argument goes, suicide is inevitable. So they need a safer, more certain way to do it. The family might be able to be involved and be less shocked. And indeed, uh, there may even be a deterrent value uh, to suicide for many. But I just want to address this issue of futility because futility really is, uh, if you're gonna postulate futility, you're gonna to have to deal with important issues, unpredictable diagnoses, unpredictable prognoses, inaccessibility of psychiatric treatment and treatment diversity. You know, the diagnostic reliability is to, to create a prognosis, you need to have a diagnosis in order to be able to sort of predict what, what the future is going to be. And our diagnostic reliability uh, and use, utilizing the current diagnostic criteria is only about 66 to 76%. As Scott Kim said, it's not easy to distinguish between a patient who's suicidal and a patient who qualifies for psychiatric euthanasia because they share many key traits. In some cases, psychiatric euthanasia is simply a highly effective means of suicide. With regard to unpredictable prognoses, even if you get the diagnosis right, uh, we really are not very good. Even if you say, okay, we all agree this patient has schizophrenia. We all agree this patient has bipolar disorder. Uh, in fact, uh, as this uh, review of the uh, science of prognosis in psychiatry, it is not very well developed. So our level of certainty about what's going to happen to patients, how treatable or untreatable they are, what the natural history of their illness is going to be, is just, you know, does not actually stand up uh, in any significant measure to other kinds of medical disorders. Um, the past president of the Canadian Psychiatric Association uh, says an extensive review of the literature shows that we cannot predict irremediability when it comes to mental illness. I'm not going to review the rest of that quote in the interest of time, and I'm going to skip, skip this as well. Also, futility assumes that people have access to treatment. Uh, in fact, the World Health Organization said the number one cause of inadequate recovery from mental health disorders is inadequate at uh, access to treatment. And particularly in countries with socialized medicine in Canada, the wait for uh, psychiatric treatment on average is even more than 90 days uh, on average for people. So uh, inadequate resources uh, due to finances and inadequate facilities and not enough treaters is the usual reason why there's so-called futility in mental health disorders. And then finally, treatment diversity. There are so many different possible treatments for different disorders, not all of which, by the way, are easy to get, not all of which uh, are, have uh, trained personnel, not all of which may be covered, uh, even in socialized countries. Uh, you know, I have a colleague in, uh, in the Netherlands who say that it is easier to get approval for euthanasia than it is to get approval for uh, vagal nerve stimulation for uh, treatment resistant obsessive compulsive disorder or depression. Um, before we try assisted suicide, Mrs. Rose, let's give the aspirin a chance. Um, I'm going to skip this point and just make the point that this idea that, you know, it is in the interest of embracing autonomy that these uh, methods are promulgated uh, of. Uh, allowing people to you know, determine uh, how they're gonna tie. But I wanna point out that in all the jurisdictions, it's a kind of pseudo autonomy because at the end of the day, it is 
not the patient who decides whether their condition is acceptably untreat, unbear, untreat, unbearable. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the doctor really uh, ultimately decides which treatable claims or untreatable claims are plausible because it's up to the doctor to approve these methods. Uh, as the most solemn and consequential intervention a physician can be asked to make, the decision to kill is oddly contingent on a single mercurial human conscience. And that is not the conscience of the physician, uh, of the patient, it's the conscience of the physician. And of course, we in psychiatry understand the phenomenon of countertransference and projective identification and the way in which a patient's hopelessness can infect the treater. Uh, and that the treater can be unconsciously recruited into a sense of futility, hopelessness, and exhaustion that is really more about the patient uh, and also uh, more about protecting the, the, the physician from their own anxieties in the face of death, exhaustion, and hopelessness, and gl as Glenn Gabbard reminds us. So what this does is this also, by medicalizing this, uh, we create a line, a line between what's acceptable suicide for some and unacceptable suicide for others. Uh, and by, out, by medicalizing this and say, okay, well, doctors are able, we're gonna put it in the hands of physicians to decide this suicide is acceptable, but this other suicide isn't access, acceptable. Taking it out of the hands of the patient, uh, making it a medical procedure, actually removes what uh, I think we all understand to be one of the deterrents to suicide. Uh, that the taboo, the unacceptability of suicide is actually uh, something that is a very significant uh, suicide prevention aspect. So I wanna to submit to you that psychiatric euthanasia, euthanasia in general, but particularly with psychiatric patients and asking psychiatrists to do it is an inversion of the fundamental ethos of what it means to be a psychiatrist, who we are and what we do. We are the professionals who prevent suicide, not provide it. This is our core and fundamental mission. Our intention therapeutically is to ameliorate as much suffering as we can, to shore up coping mechanisms for demoralization, discouragement, to help people with their fear, to understand the context of suffering, uh, we help patients try to beat a path, to create a path and accompany them in compassion. Remember, compassion means to suffer with, to accompany them on a path to a better future. In fact, we even have the skill set in psychiatry to help make meaning out of suffering uh, that cannot be resolved uh, because we have the skills for deeply listening and accompanying people in the journey of suffering, offering our presence and hope, mobilizing support systems. To do otherwise is an inversion. The psychiatrist's therapeutic role is to be a container of anguish, despairing and hopeless emotions of a demoralized or depressed patients. And by the way, I would say independent of whatever the quote diagnosis is, we have that skill set whatever diagnosis or no diagnosis you have. As such, he or she waits for an opportunity to instill hope and encouragement back into such a person. As Elie Wiesel said, despair is the question, hope is the answer, and hope is the one medicine that we as psychiatrists are particularly adept at delivering by ear. Uh, through this, what Paul Farmer uh, at Harvard calls accompaniment. I will keep you company and share your fate for a while and not just a little while. And there are many actually evidence-based uh, treatments that we have for people, especially at the end of life. Uh, I list two here for which it's considerable literature, so-called dignity therapy, meaning-centered therapy, a whole host of other things that are uh, familiar to people uh, often working in palliative care settings. Um, just as the Pope, should not perform abortions, and the Dalai Lama should not take up arms. A psychiatrist should not counsel or abet suicide, for in doing so, we have misunderstood and betrayed our vocation and profession. Validation of suicide 
or assisted suicide by psychiatrists is therapeutic and professional hypocrisy. My own mentor, uh, Paul McHugh, back when I was a resident at Hopkins, wrote about the Kevorkian phenomenon back in the 70s, where he wrote, patients are seduced by isolating them, sustaining their despair, revoking alternatives, stressing examples of others choosing to die, and sweetening the deadly poison by speaking of death with dignity. If even psychiatrists succumb to this complicity with death, what can be expected of the lay public? So I leave you finally with the words of Winston Churchill to encourage you in your accompaniment, in your journeys of compassion with your patients, and for you to deliver the medicine of hope by ear to all of your patients, uh, which is never give up, never give up, never, never, never. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kamarat. Um, I know we're running a, a little uh, over time here, but um, Dr. Kamarat, would you mind answering um, one or two questions here? Sure, and I'd be glad to. I certainly set aside a little bit of extra time just in case. And by the way, I, if you would like to be on an email list of people that are interested in assisted suicide and euthanasia in general, uh, but especially involving psychiatric patients, news stories, developments, sometimes peer-reviewed papers, just email me at this address and uh, I'll be glad to include you on my curated mailing list. So happy to take questions. Um, Dr. Conrad, thank you so much for speaking to us. This is a really, really great uh, presentation. So hypothetical question. So a lot of what you've said is um, a lot of times we don't know if they have mental illness. When they do have mental illness, sometimes they haven't gotten treatment. We don't know exactly which mental illness they've had. So just hypothetically, if we were in a situation, let's say, and I know this is impossible, but where we know exactly what they have, they've gotten all the treatments, and we know for sure that their uh, condition is, is non-modifiable. We just, we have a crystal ball and we know that. Would you still be against... Um, assisted suicide, or would that be a situation which you uh, would not be able to okay, let, me, let me answer that question in two ways. It's a very good question. Uh, so uh, first, I think it's a straw man. Uh, it is interesting as I travel the country, as I travel the world, uh, to meet with, uh, with colleagues. Uh, and I asked them the question, have you ever seen such a case? And I've been doing this for, for four years now. Uh, in my own career of 30 years, and uh, in the career of colleagues all over the world, I have yet to meet a, uh, a colleague who says, I've seen such a case. So I, I wanna just put that out there uh, because behind every uh, apparent futility uh, are a variety of reasons that I went through four of them, uh, which if you drill down, you'll see that that was there. Very often, especially in this country, uh, it's, inaccessibility of the finances and coverage for that treatment. For example, one treatment that I've seen turn the corner for many, many untreatable patients is really excellent high-end psychiatric residential treatment, uh, which is, you know, typically starts at $20,000, $21,000 a month and is not covered by insurance. Uh, and the number of patients that I have felt, you know, that's a treatment that could be available to them uh, if they could afford it. So, so you might say, okay, so what about for people who, who just don't have the finances? You know, should we set up a system where we should uh, allow suicide for those who can't afford certain treatments and those who can? And that gets into a whole other stratification of, of ethical problems. Uh, the second thing that I want to say is that uh, let's use the straw man. Let's go with that. Uh, and say, yes, there, there exists such a case, uh, and let's postulate such a case, okay? I still believe that if you want to make suicide available to such a case, that it should not take place in the house of medicine, that that is not what doctors do, uh, that is not our fundamental ethos. If society, in what I believe uh, is a misguided uh, set of public policies, wants to open that option, uh, just like we physicians have declared that we do not participate in lethal executions for uh, prisoners, uh, 
uh, or uh, we don't uh, participate. We don't uh, participate in. Uh, uh, we don't have sex with our patients, even though it might be therapeutic and argued in their in their best interests as part of their therapy. Uh, that I think uh, it is vital to maintain the idea that if you come knocking on the door of the house of medicine, we will do everything. We will take the journey. We will engage in accompaniment and compassion. We will pull out the state of the art. We will advocate for you to get treatments that you may not be able to afford. Uh, we will not abandon you. Uh, we will treat you always. We will uh, cure you sometimes, but we will kill you never. If you want to be killed, let society set up a different profession. Thanatologists, let them train pharmacists to do this. Uh, you know, let them uh, train you know, a, another class of royal executioners. It's not that hard uh, to give a lethal injection. And let's set up the clinics in the Department of Philosophy, uh, in the Department of Public Policy, in the Department of, law of the Law School, where the most fierce advocates for deploying autonomy as the argument for promulgating these public policies uh, tend to hang out. Uh, it's uh, usually not the people who have to be at the giving end of those needles uh, that tend to be the fierce advocates for this. It's those who say that we physicians, you guys should be doing this. So if you could show me such a case and you wanna create a society that allows such cases to have it done, uh, I say, do it down the street in the law school. Thank you, that's a good answer. Hello, so this is Dr. Rivera. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Hi, Dr. Rivera. So, so, so I practice geriatric psychiatry. So my, my bane of my existence is, is dementia, which um, in this state and day and age is still a terminal illness in, in my respect, um, with regards to not just terminal from a medical standpoint, but truly from a financial standpoint. And if we're faced with patients who are not gonna get better, gonna get progressively worse and will commit essentially financial suicide by continuing living, how do you think uh, our role would be in guiding the patient to a better answer than what we can give from a medical standpoint? Well, I, I think we have to also be be careful to overstep our charge. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, though I think that as, as a profession, we ought to be involved in the halls of Congress and so forth in advocating for better funding, uh, better health care, uh, perhaps those who uh, uh, advocate for universal health care, uh, you know, better elder care, uh, hospice, palliative care, and so forth. Uh, th certainly as a profession, we need to do that. But with regard to our, to our individual patients, uh, I think that we can certainly try to refer them to resources, uh, social workers, uh, public agencies, uh, try to get them uh, 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 prescription medication cards and samples and so forth to deal with uh, uh, ways in which there are financial shortfalls. Okay, there, there is only so much that we can do. Uh, but I think that we are at our ethical peril if we say, okay, the alternative is if you don't want to bankrupt yourself, okay, you can come to me and I will kill you, okay? And I think that's different than if a patient says, uh, I don't want to bankrupt myself or bankrupt my family member, so I would like to refuse certain treatments because those treatments will bankrupt me or, or will give me side effects that I don't want. Uh, I want to step away from treatments that you have to offer. All right, well, fair enough. Uh, maybe I'm not gonna go chasing after them, although that's an interesting question, which I don't wanna to divert to at the moment, you know, because we do do involuntary treatment in psychiatry. Uh, of all the different physicians, we're actually the most likely to, to override our patient's refusal which again, that's a whole separate question. Uh, but I think that, that to step out of the way and to say, okay, you know, I will give you comfort care 
you know, I'm not going to, you know, uh, give you expensive treatments, you know, will allow this to take its course uh, to provide you as best we can to step out of the way of death. That's something that physicians have been doing and have been doing nobly for millennia. Uh, but what we have not done is to say, okay, uh, I will go one step further. I will actually deliberately, actively terminate your life, not allowing your disease to take its course or you know, not giving things to slow down the course of your disease, but I will actually kill you. That is the point that we are at in these contemporary societies, whether it's by injection or, okay, well, I'll give you a, a chemical gun and you can go and kill yourself. Uh, and particularly, I think we in psychiatry have a special role and special expertise to say, wait a minute, we have some skill sets here where we've got some alternative ways of thinking, some alternative ways of helping you think and feel and behave. Uh, and I think that's really important for us to contribute to the conversation. And one of the reasons why I, as a psychiatrist, have felt it important that I step up in this more assertive, more activist posture, uh, because my, my, my profession, as I profess as a psychiatrist, is I want myself and all of you to be able to contribute to this conversation and to say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't bypass us. You know, don't say psychiatry or mental health shouldn't be part of this conversation, shouldn't be a necessary step in these evaluations. Uh, we have something to contribute. You know, what we have to contribute is not just saying, oh, this person is competent or not competent. We have to contribute, as I say, independent of whether there's a diagnosis or not, our skill sets to help people find a different path to a sustainable, more sufferable future. But don't you think that's playing both sides of the street? If we do not, as physicians, want to involve ourselves in the assisted death of somebody, but yet we want to have our piece of the pie in saying what we believe is right. You know, I truly believe that, uh, you know, ethically, a physician should not be involved in, in, in euthanasia directly. But that, I have to accept, and I, I don't have any say in getting in the way of that. That's a societal decision. Uh, okay, an... fair enough. I, I, I agree with you. It's a societal decision. But I also think if society, we still have a right to define the boundaries of what our profession is. Just because society says jump doesn't mean we have to say how high, right? And we can say, you know, society may say, we think you should try to convert homosexuals into heterosexuals. And we can say, that's not ethical as we have in the APA ethics code. No, we don't do that. Uh, no, we don't participate in torture. Even though society has come to us to say, help us out at Guantanamo. Uh, and Steve Sharfstein pioneered the ethical principle that said, no, psychiatrists don't do that. So yeah, society can decide whatever it wants, but just because society decides doesn't mean we have to participate. I hope that you all invite me back for my companion lecture to this, my companion lecture, which is called Vulnerable Ethics, the role of leading psychiatrists in the eugenics and forced sterilization movement in the US and the Nazi Holocaust in the so-called T4 program where society recruited us into its rapidly changing ethical mores and decided that it was virtuous, that it was a moral pioneering project to engage in a eugenics agenda, to force sterilization, especially on psychiatric patients in this country, which then went over to Nazi Germany and became euthanasia for those poor psychiatric patients in Nazi Germany of which psychiatrists were the craftsmen and the executioners of the entire program, we lost our ethical moorings because society said, jump, and we said, how high? And I think it's really, really important to, to review that history to realize how vulnerable our ethics are in societies and that we as citizens, sometimes also ourselves can become besotted with these ethical moray changes 
and lose our own ethical moorings and be swept down the river uh, so that, you know, later on we say, oh my gosh, what were we thinking? So I think we have the right and the duty to say, yes, I hear what you guys decided, but don't come to us for that. Good point, good point. And that's why I struggle with this duality that we, we have with our compulsion to say we're against it, but yet we need to have a psychiatric evaluation to see if this body is competent for the sole purpose of assisted suicide. Yeah, I actually have published uh, again about that. And I have said, I think that if a psychiatrist is going to be involved in an evaluation, mm -hmm. our purpose should not be to sign off on suicide. Uh, our purpose should be to try and recruit the patient into treatment, into therapy, into giving us a chance at accompaniment, not to just rubber stamp and say, I've ruled out depression, I've ruled out schizophrenia, I've ruled in competency, they're good to go. Uh, I actually, uh, I've, I've written that I think that that is uh, an unethical intention and an unethical action that if we're going to participate, it should be to try to have an opportunity to do our thing for these patients. Thank you very much. Looking Thank forward you. to your next uh, grand round. Uh, if you invite me back, I'll uh, look forward to g giving you that historical backdrop. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm still here for, for a little while if anybody else wants to, to ask anything. We come to the to a natural conclusion here. Well, here's the question. So it, right. it takes on to my take, first. Take another part. swing at it. Okay. If one of we are ethically bound to discuss all alternatives to treatment, including no treatment, right? Yes. What is your position of that if we had a system that didn't involve the medical profession? You know, to, to kill somebody, you don't need to be a uh, uh, right. any medical uh, training at all. If there was a particular right. agent, you don't even need a med student, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you can go to a butcher, or right. a hunter. Um, but if there was a system there, uh, would would you struggle with ethical concerns? To you, I am referring you because of your major neurocognitive disorder. Um, to this company, this disposal company, you know, I'm, I'm pushing the boundaries there because that's one of the possible uh, treatments for you that I may or may not ethically agree with, but that's out of in informed consent I have to present to you. Right, so uh, this is a, another great question. Such a great question, I'm gonna actually call you by your first name. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, no, you're going to remember me now. <laughs> you bet. You bet. And I hope you sign up for my list. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so uh, this is a very important question because this is exactly what's happening in Canada. I, I made a uh, side reference to this in the talk. I didn't have time to get into this. But in Canada, uh, particularly in, in the province of Ontario, uh, it was declared that it is neither legal nor ethical to be a conscientious objector. Now, what do I mean by conscientious objector? What the court and also the Board of Physicians determined is not that you must give euthanasia, but uh, a conscientious, the people who are conscientious objectors say, I do not want to be part of the chain of referral. Uh, they say, you know, those people who gave up the Jews hiding in basements to the Nazis were part of the chain of culpability of the Holocaust. You know, just by pointing to the window and said, there's one in there, uh, you're part of the chain of culpability. So they're saying, if I am required to tell a patient, euthanasia is an option here. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm required to say to a patient, I don't do euthanasia or discuss that with patients, but here I'm referring you to a doctor who will. Then that person says, I am part of the chain of culpability. And I want to be able as a conscientious objector to not only not give euthanasia, but not even discuss euthanasia with the patient, 
I want, and as a matter of fact, the people who are conscience objector have adopted uh, the moniker Hippocratic Physicians in Canada. I want to be a Hippocratic physician, you know, referencing that part of the Hippocratic oath that has suffused the tree, as I used that metaphor before. So, uh, and the courts have said, uh, not only is that illegal, but you might jeopardize your medical license for that reason. So what these people realizing that euthanasia is out of the bag uh, have been trying to push to set up something like the Levenzinde clinic, like they okay. had in the Netherlands to say, okay, look, patients can find their own way to the places that do this. You know, the, the, the advertised docs that do this, the hotline that you can call if you want to you uh, have a euthanasia consultation. Uh, and that, you know, they should be advertised and they should be, you know, available on the internet. So I, as a conscientious objector, don't talk about it. And by the way, the World uh, Medical Association not only has said euthanasia is uh, illegal, uh, not illegal, it's uh, unethical uh, and uh, not uh, consistent with the role of physician, but they also have an additional statement that says, in those countries where it is permitted, it is vitally important that those countries preserve every right of conscientious objecting physicians without any career penalties uh, or any other consequences of their engaging in the fullest extent of conscientious objection by refusal to not just administer these procedures, but even inform patients about the option of these procedures. So they're trying to protect, you know, those Canadian physicians who are up in arms about this. So that, that's why I would be a very strong conscientious objector to this. So I wouldn't even tell a patient about the disposal service, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I would uh, hope that any patient who is considering the disposal service comes knocking on my door. And when they knock on my door, they need to be prepared for me to do my psychiatrist thing. In fact, you know, it's, it's, very, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's very fashionable to talk about doctors' duties to their patients, right? It's not very fashionable in medical ethics, unfortunately. So look at the converse. What are the patients' duties to their doctors, right? Okay. And, so, and I think that uh, one ethical duty of a patient is to not put the doctor in the position of being asked to kill them. I actually think that that is not just unvirtuous, okay, but, but I think that it is, uh, it is unacceptable for a patient to knock on a physician's door, especially a psychiatrist's door because of who we are and what we do and say, doctor, help me to commit suicide, you know? And especially, uh, it makes it difficult if that's legal, right? I mean, if it's one thing, you know, you, don't, you can't use the law to say, look, you know, obviously I can't do that because it's not legal to do that, okay? But in a state or jurisdiction where it is legal, where a physician can come and legitimately ask the question, will you help me commit suicide? I think that puts the doctor in a tremendously bad position. I think it is a tremendous threat to the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, I think it creates a tremendous conflict of interest to the physician, and it's wrong. It's wrong for a, for a patient to do that. Of course, patients will. As a matter of fact, I've had several people come approach me to ask for me to evaluate them so that they can take uh, a, the psychiatric evaluation that is required for euthanasia tourism by Switzerland, uh, the Dignitas organization that uh, does, and they don't even use doctors there uh, for that, that does these assisted suicides. You've got to have a psychiatrist in your own country who signs off on it. Uh, so I, I have refused to do those. And I've said to people, look, if you want to talk to me about continued treatment, that I'm willing to talk about, okay? But I'm not going to be writing any report so that you're able to go get assisted suicide. All right, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. All right, I know there's so much more we could talk about. I, I appreciate you indulging uh, my passion on this for some extra time. And I